Good day, so uh, first of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Thank you so much for having me, Guy. I've been waiting for this occasion for um, probably all year now, so my day has come. Here And here we are. Uh, so I have a four-part series of questions to help kick us off and, and, and get the audience to understand you know, a little bit more about you. So let's start off with, where were you born? I was born back in the days before the internet, remember that, um, in Hungary. And it was 1971. Um, that was the year before the whole communist era and, you know, the Soviet bloc and everything collapsed. So that was a long time ago. Yes. So so uh, how long did you spend there or where else have you lived uh, until you went to school? Uh, so I spent 29 years there just to make sure that, uh, you know, we break down the communist uh, wall and everything and everything was ready. Then I moved to the States in 99. And uh, where did you go to school and what did you study? So in Hungary, I actually had two lives. Um, one was the, the logical one, the computer science and engineering. So I have a background in computer science programming. That's when the, the, the technical part comes in. And then after that, I decided that I'm a people person. I'm not gonna sit with a computer and a pizza and like hack all day. So I did uh, the learning side of this thing. So I have two degrees in both sides. And I've been, ever since I've been playing on kind of like the technology and learning um, in between era. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about your job experience in between the two degrees or after the degrees and, and give us a little progression to where you are now? Yeah, so when I finished my schools in Hungary back then, you were supposed to join the army or do some civil service. So obviously, I was like ready for civil service. And so my first ever job was as a receptionist at the dorm. And so that was my uh, case of, okay, I, what can I use from my, uh, you know, eight years of college uh, experience? So I did a lot of uh, learning back then, creating courses already for, for students and sometimes supporting uh, faculty. And my other side job was, was actually learning how to save people from the elevators. Um, that was a physical job that I was trained on and uh, it was getting better and better. At first it was a little rough, but uh, it worked out. And so after that, that whole experience, I actually moved to the States without any job uh, experience. So it was a dot-com boom like era, like the end of it. So I caught the last, uh, I think, wave. And so I got hired as a temp right away for two months. I was so excited. And I worked uh, in Boston where we lived uh, for two months just to have some sort of experience that I can put in my resume. And um, what's quick funny story about that, I was actually assigned to the, the major donors office um, at the university. Uh, at Harvard University. And so I had to wear a suit every single day. I did like Microsoft Word, Word and Excel thing, but in a suit all day. And after two months, I was like, I need a job where I don't need to wear a suit because it just don't don't work me out. Well, and so after that, um, we got married and I got like a real, you know, citizenship and all that. And I started my my job back in the early as a tech writer. Um, I had no idea what the job was. All I saw was in the description that you need to know technology and you need to know how to explain things. So I was like, this is perfect. It's me. And so I did it a couple of two years or three writing technology driven sort of um, exercise. I work for a company that's part of IBM now. And um, that was the first time that I'd been exposed to very smart people from MIT, all these uh, back the early days of, of, of learning technology that was amazing, uh, flash, <laughs> end of an era, and that sort of thing. And from there, it started more shifting between creating interesting things just for the sake of creating something for our, our learners to more like, how do I actually help people to do their job better, easier or faster? And so I spent the last 20 years in various um, companies in, in the uh, private sector, public sector, and all was about technology and learning kind of uh, combined. And uh, the end, end of this was two years ago when the whole pandemic happened and all that and I had to switch somehow. And that's when I went to Amazon 
And um, right now I'm working at Amazon as a senior learning technologist. And it's a new world for me. Definitely the whole company inside is like a, like a whole world. But that's kind of like uh, my, my transition went from how can I create cool things in Flash that people love to how can I not create these things and actually help people do their job better. Well, that's a great uh, <laughs> that's a great backstory. So thank you for sharing that. And it's a great segue into my next question. The name of my series is HPT Videos, Human Performance Technology, also known as Human Performance Improvement. But but over the decades, people have called this many different things, performance technology, uh, improvement technology, et cetera, et cetera. It's all about evidence-based practices for helping people learn how to perform better in whatever context they may be. But can you share with us, you know, for our audience so that they understand, well, who were some of your early influences in that arena uh, and, and people or books or articles that you might point them to as, as uh, resources that they might follow up with themselves? Yeah, so again, from my perspective is the learning perspective of, of these things. So in between the pure performance coaching um, and the other side is just learning design and, and, and exciting things that has nothing to do with the actual job. And so one of the early ones, I had a book on my shelf for a long time from uh, Gary Rumler. I'd never read it. It was just, you know, it's not one of those exciting, full of pictures, uh, lovely book. Like it actually gets into the real details of, of HVT. But I had it on my shelf um, with others. But when I actually started looking into this, it's around the, around the early 2000s, when I actually met people that received my learning. And so that was an eye opening uh, to see them in their context, uh, call center. You know, in their context, this one monitor they had juggling between seven applications and they were supposed to be being empathetic for the customers at the same time, <laughs> digging up their emails and all kinds of things. And then I realized that the training that we create is some sort of a pseudo, um, unicorn sort of thing. And we assume that these people go somewhere in an LM, magical LMS, take that training, come back, and they know what to do in their environment. So this is what I started. And I think from the learning perspective, um, I mean, besides actually learning about performance support, um, action mapping was one of the first things that I started doing or implementing um, and from Kathy Moore. And that, after reading the book, actually, there's a lot of overlap and explanation and simplification of that, but it worked well in the learning environment. Starting from back from the job and go all the way back as a chain reaction. And the very last thing is your content. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, so what was the what was the Rumler book that intrigued me that you had that? Uh, do you remember the name of the book? Uh, there was one was about the Y space. Um, so yes, that's that. improving performance. And improving. I think there's a new version of that, or I was. Yeah, there's one. there's three editions out. The first two were kind of uh, written and sanctioned by uh, the late Gary Rumler, and then the third version is the the written by the company yeah. bought out his intellectual property, etc. Uh, but it, it was again, it was way ahead of my my thinking at that point um because one thing that i learned for the last 20 years is that you can separate the learning part the performance part the talent management part and think that you're driving the right because it's basically moving the same person dragging into different ways and poor person is like sitting in the middle of like what, what can i do now i just want to really get this thing done um, yeah. so yeah that's how it started well excellent well thank you for that um, so I guess this, this next question, uh, uh might, uh, might resonate here because I'm going to ask you about your elevator speech. And since you've already mentioned elevators before, I think <laughs> a slightly different way, but, but so I, as I set this up, cause I want to help people understand how they can explain to others what they do, because this has been a challenge. It's been a joke at conferences that I've been going to since the 1980s how to explain what it is we do. So if you were at a garden party and somebody came up to you and they didn't know you and they asked you, so what do you do? 
what would be your 30 second elevator speech explaining what it is that you do? Um, so it really depends on the title uh, of my job. Uh, but I think for now, the easiest, because you, usually there is, even if it's a garden party, there's people somehow uh, along the lines of either uh, performing or learning in some sort of context. So the easiest way now, I'll just say that I'm actually um, into creating more impact rather than content. And so that's short enough so they understand like, okay, there's content and there's impact and intrigue them like, what do you mean? And then we can start a conversation around, okay, like tell me about the last experience you have with your e-learning at your company. It's like, oh yeah, I have to take the uh, ethics training, the annual, it was horrible. And now they're even worse because I can't even click now, I can't even blah, blah, blah. It's like, this is what I'm talking about. That is the content. It's nothing to do with you, nothing to do with your performance. It's basically, it's just there so they can have a click tick mark somewhere. And there's a lot of other things uh, around that. And so this is like a good conversation starter of less content, more impact. Um, it sounds a little bit of like a marketing um, slogan, but I think it's a good, it, it started as a good conversation. What I try to explain of how human performance and psychology and motivation and all that, then it all goes into some like a rabbit hole of like, okay, so you are a, no, 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 not exactly. No. Yes, I know it is a struggle and it's easy to, to uh, run down into the rabbit holes with uh, explanations. And most people quite frankly, don't want to hear all of that. And <laughs> our clients and customers don't necessarily want to understand, you know, how the sausage is made is another way to put it. But uh so can you share with us right now some some of the more interesting kinds of projects that you've worked on and how you've taken a performance and impact orientation to that? Uh, you don't have to name the specific companies or target audience, but unless that's helpful and you don't mind doing that. Yeah, so a couple of things uh, was obvious in the, the beginning with this company. Um, Every time when it was training, it was the last check mark on a long list of things to do. And so by the time it came to us, it was just we have three days to create this training. And it was already like the end. And then there's nowhere to go from there. There's nothing, so we have to create content. And so I started asking those questions, the why questions, which um, didn't get me promoted, I have to say. But it, it got me um, a lot of good friends there once they... Uh, got over the fact that I'm um, asking questions instead of actually creating content as fast as I can. So one of the examples was that when, when they came to me that they really need quickly um, content for the new billing system. And here are the codes that people need to remember. I was like, okay, um, what did you have before? Like, well, we had this like X, Y, Z sort of training and it's 10 minutes. It shouldn't be more than 12 because people are on the phone and it's just going on and on and on. <laughs> Did it work? It's like, no. I was like, okay, so let's, let's talk about it. Like, why did it work? And so what the conversation led, led to is they didn't really need training because there's no way that these agents sitting on the phone supporting a new billing system are going to remember 100 different codes from old to new. And I said, why don't we just have like a, a thing that they look this up? Well, we, we don't know. We don't have that. I was like, okay, let's build something. And so like, well, but you're a training person. I'm like, yeah, I can build other things too than courses. And so it was a simple lookup table that I created for them for each region. And all they did was they came in, typed in the old code and it showed them the new code. And then they just switched. And, and then IT came in like, oh, that is great. We can put it right on their screen and then just click on it. Like, perfect. Okay, now do that. But we're rolling this out in different phases. Like, well, um, it's all coming from XML. So all you need to do is just change the code, create a new instance and put it out there. Really, that, that's, it, that's it. You don't need six weeks of you know, content creation and improvement. That's all, all we need. And then uh, six months later, I asked them, hey, how is it going? Like, we don't need it anymore. They now remember the codes and we all rolled it out. It was like, that is simple improvement, but you cannot do that if you're focusing on the content creation side of it. You need to focus on the why it's happening, how they do it, what is the context, what are the limitations, and how we can help those. Uh, the same concept happened in, in a call center later on when the request came that people and managers need more coaching training because they don't coach. It was like, okay, there's probably 
millions of off the shelf coaching training, but let me just see what happens. So again, talking to them, seeing them inside, it turns out like it's not the problem they don't know how to coach. They don't have time because what they do is they retraining the people from the training that they just took. Like literally six weeks of training, they arrive and they don't know anything what to do. And these managers, for managers, don't have time to do that. And so I asked them like, what would help? It's like, oh, what it would really help if I can just quickly find the things to send these people to the refresher and then come back and ask the questions because then I can answer some of the questions already. And if they don't, the question is going to be better. I was like, fine, then let's build that. And so I went back and I said, well, we don't need training. Uh, what we need is some help because we don't know where to put this thing. Uh, it needs some kind of web server, bring in IT, bring in leadership. Uh, will they support that? What are the metrics? And that's another thing that learning usually swipe like under the rug of, of how you actually measure success. So in this case, it was literally how much time they have today and how much time they have tomorrow. And it was simple as that and it worked well. So those are the uh, little things that not a large project, it's like a VR and we solve the world health problems and all that, but it really helped the audience and, and make their life much better. Well, I really like those stories. And that's a, that's, that's a good example of uh, asking the questions about the performance and the issues within the performance and then looking for and defaulting to performance support or what we used to call job aids or guidance back in the day before we, because if the context doesn't demand a memorized performance response, we if it allows for a reference performance response, we need to give people those references. And if they use them often enough, they'll memorize what that is and they won't need to refer to something. Yeah. But but too often, this has been an age old issue and I so I really like those stories of that, that that you're thinking that was your approach. And and so can you talk a little bit about any resistance that you got from any of the stakeholders when you were doing this and how you might have addressed their issues? Yeah. So what's interesting about the two stories is one was is internal when because it's very um, important to understand where your role is in, in the in, in the ecosystem. So if you are an employer and you have a group of people, these designers and helpers inside, then it's a different story. You have to live with those people, the stakeholders, the, the, you have to go to meetings and all that. You can't just leave. Um, so it's a long distance game of how you um, get buy-in. And in that case, it was for me, um, the most, I think, problem came from, from training, not the stakeholders, because mm -hmm. Training had an agenda of when to deliver when and how and then and, and move on. And for me, it was, uh, what if we create something that's not going to work? Because uh, it's new. We haven't done it before. And it's like, this is exactly why we're doing it, because we haven't done it before, because <laughs> it might work. Um, and so it was less about the stakeholder problem, because they were in the corner, like they needed something as fast. Um, if you walk into the business and say, I can do something, maybe 80% work right now, or wait six months and I'll bring you some crazy good 100% thing, they always picked up now. Yeah. Um, the other example was outside as a consultant. And that is a very different story when you walk in as a consultant, because you are paid to tell the truth. And if they don't want you to tell the truth, then you leave. And so you can make this uh, decision with the stakeholders a high and so whoever writes the check is that I'll bring what I found and it's up to you what you do with it. You can completely ignore that. You can completely say like, let's do everything what I say or somewhere in between, but it's going to be things that you might not agree with. And I need someone on top who says, at least hear me out and then you can do whatever you want with it. And so in that case, I had to find that person who says, okay, um, there is some mis uh, communication between higher management and lower management. One is focusing on X, the other one is Y. And I said, look, in between these other people, what do you want, Y or X? And then I can't do both. So here's one way to solve the problem. And if you like it, let's do it. If not, just take it that it's yours. A report is yours and let's continue. So I, I think it's much easier to do a one-time quick thing like that as a consultant. 
but at the same time you leave and you don't see most of the time your your data you can refer to that back you can take it to another customer so it's a it's a life of a consultant yeah there's a you know there's an advantage there's an advantage when you're inside in that if you do have successful projects you build a reputation and that kind of sticks with you. And that yep. might make it easier the next time you're dealing in a difficult situation and trying to convince people to do something that's non-traditional, non-standard. And when you're when you're a consultant, then you have to earn though that the, the, your your reputation for each and every project, and then you move on. But I think that there is that advantage where it, when you're a consultant, usually when they brought you in from the outside, you get a little bit more attention than if you're an inside. Uh, consultant or, con or contributor, and it's it's sometimes easier so, to the decision maker rather than the middle men and women that uh, may uh, assume that the people at the top want something very specific, but it's you know they want the means. Mm -hmm. The people at the top really want the ends; they want the results. Yep. They don't want the yep. any way to get to the results is good. But thank you for those stories. Uh, let me switch gears here a little bit. As a lifelong learner, can you share with us anything that you are particularly focused on right now for your own learning? Uh, yeah. So right now, what I'm trying to do is what I've been trying to do for, I think, the last decade. Um, but finally, what we're getting there is moving away from this traditional concept of we're going to create a course, you um, have the end receipt of the course, and then maybe go through the LMS and build dashboards and that sort of thing. Um, so actually, you mentioned Will Kleinheimer early on, uh, our pre-conversations. Um, he's one of my uh, heroes um, out there who puts his head out and, and says things that everybody should listen to. And so we're implementing LTEM, um, the learning transformation evaluation model, because I believe it's a good concept. It's a model, but it's a good concept to focus the right thing for, for designers as well as stakeholders. It's a practical application of the thing. It's not so theoretical. It's not so dramatically different than we would say like, well, let's stop because we're, um, we're coming into a completely black territory. Uh, but it itself is sending the right messages. So we're implementing that in the behind the scenes, sort of like the driver but also the technology side of things. Finally, learning should be a two-way conversation sort of approach. I always think about it as a, as a, a multiplayer game. Um, instead of saying like, I'm gonna create a course and that's gonna like teach you something, but think about your problem in context of a game. Who are the players? What are the rules around that? What, what would be some of the players' hidden initiatives and, and because it's one thing that we talk about is in, in performance, there's always an incentive. You can create the learning of what you want, um, the most expensive and creative VR, first person shooter thing, whatever that is. If these people are not incentivized to do something, it's gonna fail. And so this way in a game point of context, let's think about it as a, as a, as a, as a two-way conversation between system elements and then figuring out who's who, how they're moving, what the connections mean, uh, and just learn what you need to learn and when you need to learn it, basically. Yeah, I think that too often we see the learner uh, a job title in isolation. We don't see them as part of a, a, a community of practitioners working in processes or workflows and they're not all by themselves doing things. Now, sometimes they are, if it's a call center person, they're interacting with the customer, et cetera, and they're not part of it necessarily a team effort all the time. There may be times when they are, but but we too often don't see that, that broader context and all the consequences that exist uh, for certain kinds of behaviors. And sometimes we ask people to do things that are somewhat punishing and the reward system is lacking. Yeah. And, and therefore, we're, Rumler said at one time in 1981 in a video that, uh, that, I, that I, I was attending at Motorola session, and he talked about pushing 50 feet of wet rope. And that's often what it feels like when we don't have a, a better understanding of the performance context and all of the, all the performers, all the players in that context, and, and all the situational variables that they're all dealing with. Uh, that, that's an issue. So are you are you are you doing any writing? I know you have a blog, but uh, 
Are you doing any writing about the things that you're working on? And, and this, uh, this uh, implementation of Altem is one example. So not the, not the writing itself. Um, in, in Amazon is an interesting place. We, we do things by writing. So it, we actually write certain types of, of pieces that drives the, later the implementation um, and not creating like PowerPoint sort of things, funny pictures in it uh, and cut out persons. So the writing actually happens before we actually implement a lot of um, reviews and cycles and all that. So it takes a lot of time to, to get there with a clear picture of what we're building. So we're in the building sort of phase now. We're actually doing a proof of concept for the next six months. And from there, I can take some of these that I can share. Other will be probably uh, stay in Amazon. But as far as writing, um, one of the things that came out from this whole writing process conversation was engagement. Um, the word engagement is a, a very abstract thing, both in the performance and learning uh, world, because everybody wants pe people to be engaged. And yet they don't know how to measure that. They don't know how to define that. And they start incentivizing them. So if you're engaged, you get more money or your bonus. So like, what do you mean by that? What do you want me to do exactly? Because I can smile. Is that engagement or, or what exactly were you going? So I published a three-piece article on that in elearningindustry.com of getting into the top five, six things that learning and development use tools to attack um, engagement and why they're not working. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. I, if you'll share that URL with me, I'll put that in the yeah. show notes so we can point people to that. So let me switch gears here again a little bit. And my next question has to do with the language and labels that we use in the profession. And this has been an age old issue since I've been in the game, but is there a performance improvement or learning term or phrase that, <laughs> excuse me, that you would like to define for us because perhaps you see it being misused or misconstrued? But is there any anything in particular that you would like to uh, share with us? That's a perfect segue um, back to my previous comment about engagement. The reason I started writing that one blog, which turned into be three pieces of article, is, is because it's a very nuanced word. And everybody has these labels and they think whatever they want, particularly spe specifically under the engagement. So in the learning world, when you mention that engaged learners, what people usually think that they have to design experiences, there's a lot of um, physical activity in them. So if it's an e-learning, has to be drag and drops and clicks and, and whatever those things are because people are not falling asleep and that is engagement for it. And so in the article generally, and, and I always tell learning designers that at least think about um, as an analogy, let's say you're driving somewhere so you have your destination, you really want to be there. That's your motivation. Maybe you see friends, family, that sort of thing. That journey includes at least three types of engagement. One is the physical one. You grab the wheel, you use the clutch and whatever. So you're moving. Uh, but by itself, that itself is not just everything around you. The second one is you actually have to make decisions, cognitive decisions. So if you don't, you could probably run into something. So where to go, what a strategy is, where to turn, where to stop by, if you're hungry, that sort of thing. It's all like the mental one. And then finally, you can still do that, being bored to death throughout this experience. So what are the, uh, which we usually forget about performance size because we just want numbers, but there's always the human side of the emotional side of things. So are you satisfied with what you're doing, exciting what you see, are you thinking about what you're going to do with your friends so you have some motivation going still because you love what you do? So that's the experience part. So think about the same thing for a learning. Um, you always define these three things separately, and they might change throughout the learning experience, but focus all of them as a balance rather than picking out one and let's say I'm going to make this really funny, uh, this video. And so now it becomes entertainment. It is emotionally high, but you have zero, zero questions that it mental questions, and you don't do anything besides clicking on the start button. So that's, I think for me, engagement is the one of the critical points of, of design, but you really have to understand what you mean by that and how you measure that at the very end. 
Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I think it's a balance of all three as, as appropriate to you know what's being learned and where you are in that process of, of learning something. So my next question is, I'd like to know a little bit more about, in order to share this with our audience, some of the people and books and resources that you come across more lately that you would want to point others to um, and share with them some of the gems that you found. But uh, who are some of the people you've mentioned, Will Tallheimer, you've uh, mentioned uh, Kathy Moore. Um, who else would you add? So actually, I have a book uh, section here. <laughs> Um, so you might know this guy. Um, yes, yes, yes. This is a good one, I think, as a very good refresher around um, uh, the, the concept um, with with the caveat that you also have to, again, apply these things. It's not a light read of I'm going to go through that at the, at the beach and then go back and I have uh, a, a great session, you know, brainstorming from whatever that is like taking chapter by chapter, just like Kathy Moore's book. Mm -hmm. It is not meant to be read and then done sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Miriam Neal and I definitely, uh, and, and Paul definitely want to um, invite people to read this because it's full of um, evidence in from learning design with practical explanations in it. And whether you agree with them or not, that's another thing on, on very specific things, whether they work for you in your organization or not. But at least when you try things, you try, you, you have, do not have to try and fail. You have to try from, from evidence. Um, and then Donald Clark is an interesting person, definitely, um, if, especially if you follow him. He's not a shy person. Um, he has definitely strong opinions about things. Uh, has a great collection in this book as well around what works and what doesn't, and here's the research why. And I think on top of these, I, I definitely go back to Will Feinheimer, both for the LTEM and his revised version of the level one evaluation, the smile sheet that works well. And then just um, from the learning perspective, I really like um, uh, some of the um, guilds and ATD publications that is more around one specific topic and less about just very generic things. So Julie Dirksen is, is a great writer, very practical, pragmatic, um, like her writings as well for learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing uh, those people and some of their writings. Um, um, I, yeah, so I think that, you know, there's such a proliferation of, of content out there, and there are people who I believe are really Evidence informed, as as Paul and Miriam might say, or evidence based, as as the rest of us might say. But <laughs> it used to be called research based back in the yes, 70s and 80s when I first came on the scene. But um, yeah, so there's there's a lot to be learned, and there's a lot of good people out here. I I refer a lot to people who are no longer with us or deceased because they were my mentors. But there are. Uh, hundreds of people that are doing a good practice and we can learn from them and, and social media makes them so accessible to us nowadays. Um, thank you for including my uh, book in there. And it's, yeah, that, my books are not easy reads. <laughs> I've, I've heard that uh, for a long time now, but anyway, thank you. Uh, so, so thank you so much for doing this interview with me. So my, my final question to you is what advice or guidance might you provide to somebody who is kind of coming new into the field? We have this tremendous churn of new people coming into the field all the time. And so what would you advise them? How would you advise them as they enter into this field um, and to help make their practices uh, perhaps more evidence-based, more evidence-informed? So three things. One is back into my little slogan of less content and more impact. So start with that. You don't start with, with a course mindset of what and how I make this one course engaging with the content that I get from the SME. You're already locked in and you're, you're doomed if, if that's your starting point. So um, start out with what actually happens on the job, whether it's uh, task analysis, uh, go visit the people, even try to do the job yourself, that sort of thing. 
all the way back to the business and go backwards from there. Um, ask the right questions, that's the second one. Don't be afraid of, of asking those whys, uh, even if you pair it with the best SME in the world. Um, in fact, you should have three of them because if you rely on one, you can fall into all these traps that we can have another HPT video on. Um, so <laughs> ask the right questions, what are they doing, why, and so on, and go backwards uh, from them. And then the last thing is follow people and find those people who give you practical examples rather than um, just theory. Because when I, I, when I run into resistance in learning is mostly people saying like, well, if it were true, we would have been doing it by now. I was like, yes, but have you tried it? No. So sit down, do things, measure that. And if it works, it's great. If it's not adjusting it, you don't have to wait for the perfect thing that you create and put it out there because the business is not going to wait. Definitely. So thank you so much for that advice. I think that's a uh, very right on. And uh, again, thank you for doing this interview with me. Thank you so much for having me and uh, enjoy the rest of your beach reading. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. You have a great day.